we're taken from this first interrogation, blindfolded, and um, when the blindfold comes off, there's a man in front of me in sort of medical scrubs with a syringe. I'm just thinking, what? Where am I? And then I'm picked up again, blindfolded, and I'm pulled and walked for maybe 15 minutes. Suddenly, I'm thrown in a cell. And um, that was the last time I saw Dawood. We are separated to different cells. And when I opened my eyes, I saw that there's no Philip there. And see that this intelligence around me, and they're beating me, and while they're beating you, and they ask questions. And somehow, what happened to us took us into really the heart of what the Sudanese government is doing to its people, and we experienced what all these other people that I often film experience. I am in Darfur to investigate alleged human rights abuses with producer Dawood Hari. I had worked with him since the beginning of the war here in 2004. He had always taken care of me when we were covering that bitter conflict where hundreds of thousands had died. We had lost touch for many years, but in 2016 I found Daoud as an exile in New York City, driving a yellow cab. Together, we decided to come back to Darfur and find out what was really going on here. We wanted to investigate rumours of the government using chemical weapons and alleged atrocities on the ground. Journalists are not welcome here. A little bit strange. We need to wait until a little dark come. Then we cross. I want to get a truth. In Chad, we found hundreds of thousands of Darfuri refugees in camps. With little hope of return, many were digging new mud houses. These Darfuris were still too scared to go back to their villages, only a few kilometers away. So we're just waking up in the Dafori refugee camp here in Amnabak, and um, we're about 40, 50 kilometers away from the Sudanese border now, which is just straight to the east. And uh, we'll start making our way across and uh, pre try and prepare for a crossing late tonight. Six days. Yeah, two across the border. Okay. Probably night. Tough. What you gotta do? The Sudanese Liberation Army, who have been fighting the government for 14 years, offered us an escort. Our mission now was to travel deep into Darfur, some 600 kilometers, and reach a chain of mountains called the Jebel Mara, one of the last rebel outposts and where the government has allegedly targeted civilians. So it's after five years, six years, the government closed the border. It's not let anybody in 
foreign journalists, especially foreign journalists, and we will not get any stories, and we will not get anything happen here. Now, now I'm here. We want to get those truths out. As we headed south, deeper into Darfur, helicopters started to fill the skies, always close to our location. We began to suspect we were being tracked. Serious, no? What's going on there? So, uh, right now, the commander is talking with another commander of the field. It's a government, uh, Janja, government offer for the Janjaweed to hunt it white guy journalists inside Darfur. What? Offer for a head like five billion Sudanese pounds, oh, which shit. is two hundred fifty thousand U.S. dollars. So this commander's now confirmed from his friend that they were searching for us, special for you. Jesus. So we need to go hiding. We have to run for another three days or four days. Who knows? Maybe uh, six days. So it becomes apparent that we're being hunted, with government forces surrounding us. All our routes out of Sudan are now cut off. And I can't quite believe this at the beginning. I'm like, the government, has, you know, a government has just put a bounty on a foreign journalist. So we're um, hiding, basically. So everyone in the area has gone crazy to try and find us. So we're, we're going to try and lie low for a few days. So we had another piece of news today, um, which is not good. Uh, which is basically this SIM card, which is my Thuraya SIM card. And we've learned through the rebels' contacts um, that they have inside some of the government areas here that they've been tracking my phone. We dumped the phone, desperate to avoid capture by the notorious government-backed militia called Rapid Force. Unable to turn back, we left our rebel escort and decided to travel with the smuggler to the final stages into the Jebel Mara mountains. As soon as I'm in his car, there's, it's a different feeling. There's a change. Even though your intuition tells you something, when you're in these situations, you, you can't go back. You can't step off the boat. Um, once you've made the decision, you're on that road. Daud and I are now with the smuggler, and we're um, passing through this mountain road. We've been going about an hour. Suddenly, this flash of lights in front of us, guns go off, bang, bang, and men run to the side of the car. And I press the emergency phone number, and I take the tracker, which is like this big, and I put it in my pants, um, and then I just sit still, and I realize, right, it's all happened. We're, we've been caught. So, um, three nights ago, we got stopped at a roadblock and uh, basically kidnapped. Um, and we've had three days of uh, being in chains um, by a, a government militia called Rapid Force. And um, anyway, this morning they've let me have my camera as we've tried to make friends with them. But we're 
still in chains as such. Um, Dowd and I. Show Dowd's feet here. Um, and mine. Uh, they're just over there. And um, we don't know if we're going to be sold to the government of Sudan or if we're going to be set free because the militias are no real friends of the government themselves. Um, but, uh, yeah, we've been left under a tree with just two guards now. And um, we'll see what happens. Here's Dawood waking up. Good morning, Dawood. How are you feeling? Not good. How, are you? How many days kidnapped now? Four days. What did they do to us? Uh, nothing, just chained. Tied. Mm. They beat you at the beginning, though, in the car. Yeah. Dawood and I had now become hostages. Our fate now rested with these young militia kidnappers. Our two guards, in order to stave off their own boredom, began trying to take photos with my camera. Give me. We're just here with the... What they didn't know was that as I explained the camera to them, I was secretly pressing the video button. Um, so our kidnappers are now behind the camera. OK. As we're... Uh... Mm. Okay. So, uh, kidnapped in Darfur. Okay. We spent the days under one tree in a wide expanse of desert. It would have been impossible for anyone to find us. What about you after four days here in your chains? After four days, um, I feel uh, um, well. The first two days, the first day, they, they bound us up in chains to a tree um, in the sun, which was pretty brutal. Um, and then, as as their commanders negotiate somewhere else. Two guys here, our guards, under the, um, they've got a bit bored, so they've become nicer and nicer to us, really. Give me. We're just here with the... After three, four days, and Philip asking the kidnappers, and they brought the camera to Philip. Like, he pretending, and, and he want to teach them. They don't know. Philip. Recording. So our kidnappers are now behind the camera. Okay. okay. As we're. Uh... So this is the situation. Five days, four days. First day they hung us up in chains all day in the sun. And now we're good. I feel that having this memory card, taking this footage, it empowers me. It gives me some sense of. Um, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm captive and I'm passive, but actually, I'm working. I'm back to being a filmmaker and I'm getting this stuff and it's good and I'm, you know, I've got something that they don't know. And for me, that was very important. You know, I was a hostage. Sometimes a Philip is uh, recording us where we are 
uh, you take the, the SIM card. I knew this SIM card, what are you want to do, Philip? He said, uh, I want to hide it. Vivi! Philip, yeah. how does it feel to be a hostage in my country? I mean, it's been shattering. Um, but it just shows what, uh, how scared this government are. Any journalist, any independent assessment of what's happening in Darfur in 2017. And you, Daoud? You're going to be handed to government. Maybe they will get me free. I don't know where I go. So, th this car comes towards us at night. And it comes towards us and it's the commander and he tells the two guys to um, put us in the truck. And he tells me that, um, right, you're going to be sold to the government, you're going to be given to the government. He tells Dawood that he's going to be released. And after one hour drive, they stop. Uh, they took me out. They drive Philip south again and, and two o'clock morning, the middle of bush, they give me one water. They give me a cigarette. They would yell, where are we going? He said, we told you we we're going to release you. And I left alone over there. I can't walk, and I left Philip, middle of nowhere. So I start firing my cigarette, and uh, Keep booking the stars. This is my first time we separated, and uh, suddenly I felt I was very alone. We set off in this convoy of six cars, and uh, I'm told I'm going to be flown to Khartoum. But I'm really very nervous. Um, the fact that I'm still blindfolded and being hidden and, and not, you know, I can't see anything. And in this car, they tell me that they're going to throw me from the back of a plane. I can't see, but I feel I'm brought onto a plane and I hear this big sound, whirring sound, like there's, there's a ramp. And I, I feel the webbing, and I wrap my arms in all the webbing. And uh, I really beg them. I say, please, please, you know, please don't kill me. Please take me off this. In the morning, I saw the cars coming back. And I shout, oh, oh, I'm here. Oh, Dawood. Oh, they go, are you okay? I said, I'm okay. So why you come back? They said, oh, things change. But then I'm blindfolded again. They put me in an airplane and um, went to Khartoum. We're brought into what I feel is, or sense, is like this big space, um, blindfolded, and but the, you know, the floor there's an echo, um, and I'm forced down into this uh, sort of kneeling, quite stressed position, and my blindfold's taken off, and I'm facing a wall, and uh, I look to my left and right, and it's a corridor, and then I see on my left is Dawood. And um, I try and catch his eye or think of something funny to say, but <laughs> I can't say anything. I just like, this is shit. Um, that was the last time I saw Dawood in prison. The 
bunch of Sudanese intelligence around me, repeating me, and it's like I have a fever, 200 degrees. Torture is like hell. I've been tortured 2006. I came again. I ran away from the country. I came after 14 years, and then again to this. This is uh, come on. And I realized that this is the beginning of something new. This is now an interrogation. So then the interrogator asked me, what have you filmed and where's the footage? So I tell him that I filmed X and Y, but all the footage is gone. And then suddenly they all leave the room and I'm alone in the room. And then the terror man, this, this man comes and just sits there. Uh, and I'm aware that there's about to be physical violence. So I, I want the others to come back. And I say, I'll carry on, I'll carry on talking. But then he goes behind me and he sort of cuts off my airways. And it's asphyxiation. And you feel like you're semi-drowning. this was going on, I knew I had this footage hidden inside me. So I thought, you can beat me, humiliate me, but I've still got the footage, I've still got the film, and whatever you do, you don't know. This room in a cell, a small cell, it's four by four, I guess. After a few hours, I started to talk to my cellmate. And they told me, be careful. They were taking you interrogation every day. Sudanese intelligence, they came again any moment. So I wake up in this cell. Um, there's some sort of light coming in. And uh, there's a man next to me who shares his blanket with me. And uh, he immediately tells me to stand up. He gives me a toothbrush and he makes me clean myself and stand up and, you know, just not lie in the corner as a victim. And, uh, you know, this young man, it's, he, he, he picks me up and I realise um, that I have to accept his help. And in the coming days, I met more cellmates, academics, businessmen, students, pensioners, many accused of opposition activity some for simply sharing text messages deemed subversive. None of us were formally charged or knew how long we would be held. Sometimes you need to get peace. Sometimes you pray for your God. Sometimes you sleep two hours and wake up. And your mind not stop to, to worry about a lot of stuff. Your life, your family, The day is just painful, it's so long. There's nothing there, no book, no pen, no paper. You're not allowed anything, I mean, it's nothing, it's bare. So I devised a routine. Um, I woke up always first, um, it would still be dark, but the first birds I would hear. And I would start to do exercise, so I'd run on the spot. And in my head, I was running around East London. Victoria Park, this beautiful park by my house. And also in the, in the evenings, I started to tell stories, the fairy tales that I tell my son in London. And it, it was amazing, I mean, the men loved it. And um, yeah, it gave them, you know, we laughed and it was funny and we had these moments together. But such moments were brief for me and my cellmates. These men had found their own ways to survive the torture and uncertainty of their days in prison. They had a discipline and stayed positive and instilled in me an ability to think beyond the prison walls. 
Dowd and I had come to investigate human rights abuses. Our arrest and detention prevented that and instead revealed a hidden Sudan, one of torture and arbitrary detention. A Sudan the government does not want the world to see.